Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, I am Gopesh Modi from Bhopal, giving you the greetings for the evening. Uh, I hope everyone can listen to me. Today we have a very important talk on dealing with treatment-resistant hypertension, something that all of us uh, nephrologists face uh, day in and day out. And to talk about this, we have uh, an exceptional person with us, Dr. Indrilil Das Gupta, huge experience of nephrology behind him. He's a consultant in nephrology, Heart of England, NHS Foundation, Birmingham, UK, as well as a senior lecturer in University of Birmingham School of Clinical and Experimental Medicine. It's all uh, for you, Dr. Das Gupta, to take us through this complex and a difficult problem, and I'm sure we'll all come back and like it. Thank you very much, Gopesh. Um, hello, everyone. So this is, uh, I'm sure you can see the screen. This is what you're going to talk about. And, and I have an agenda, although I might switch from one to another. So uh, essentially talk about uh, the definition, uh, we'll put various case studies at various stages, so not kind of uh, in the beginning. Uh, we'll talk about the risk profile of these people uh, with uh, resistant hypertension, causes um, and treatment strategy and device-based treatment. I'll spend a little bit of time on non-adherence, which is uh, a, a topic very close to my heart. So I'll start with this case study. Now this is a real case. Uh, I came to my clinic. I run a hypertension clinic, and I've been running for the last 17 years. And uh, this is a patient, 46 year old man, uh, African Caribbean, referred with a very high blood pressure, as you can see, on four drugs at pretty good doses. Um, we ruled out white coat effect by doing a, a an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. He all, we'd also did an echo at the time, which is kind of routine for us in the in the clinic, and he had significant left ventricular hypertrophy. So uh, the first thing we did was because he's an African Caribbean man, as you know, they have a very high salt intake, and uh, and blood pressure is often salt sensitive in in this uh, ethnic group. Uh, we changed the bendafluoride to furosemide to more effectively clear salt sodium, uh, and then he came back three months later to my clinic, and his blood pressure is still as high. I added spironolactone as a second diuretic uh, and also a, uh, as an additional RAS blockade. And yet, as you'd see, there's no change in blood pressure, continued so on and so on. Basically, we could never control his blood pressure. Now, this is a very good example of a patient with resistant hypertension that we all deal with. Um, now, Looking at the current algorithm, now this is taken from the British Hypertension Society um, uh, guideline, but it actually applies to anywhere in the world. So this is the current algorithm for uh, treating hypertension. So those under the age of 55, you uh, should start with, a, with an ACE inhibitor um, for those over the age of 55, or if they are African or Caribbean origin, start them with a calcium channel blocker because they don't, uh, um, they ha they don't, uh, as you know, the, the renin angiotensin system is suppressed quite often in elderly people and in the African Caribbean, so you start with a calcium channel blocker, ideally. And then in the second step, if you can't control blood pressure with a, with a maximally, maximum tolerated dose, you add um, an A to C or C to A, depending on where you start. And, in this, and if you still can't control blood pressure in, in a minority of patients or some or quite significant number, if you're not quite minor, significant minority, I would say, you add a diuretic. As you know, you know how important salt is. So getting rid of sodium often makes um, blood pressure control much easier. And if you then, in step four, when in in a still a still fewer patients, blood pressure will not be controlled despite taking three drugs. Uh, and this is when you call it resistant hypertension. And the, so what um, it suggested is that you consider adding a further diuretic, like I did for my patient. I showed you a diuretic, or you can add an alpha blocker, uh, specifically um, beneficial for those who are elderly men. Um, and then you, the, the British guidance, guidance suggests that you refer these patients to an expert, a hypertension specialist. So that's the current algorithm of, uh, of management. As you can see, where resistant hypertension or treatment resistant hypertension sits. So this is essentially what I've said here. The, Reported prevalence of uh, um, treatment resistant hypertension is between varies between five to thirty percent depending on um, where they're reported from, 
But the true resistance probably is around 10%, not as high as 30%. And, um, and it is associated with significantly high risk. Now, this slide doesn't project terribly well. But just to take you through, if you look at, so, if, so what we've done here is compared resistant hypertension with, uh, with controlled hypertension in the first panel, panel A. And as you can see, they, uh, people with resistant hypertension have significantly higher risk of all cardiovascular outcome mortality and ESRD. In panel B, um, we have a compared control resistant hypertension, i.e. those people that have blood pressure over uh, under 140-90 but requiring four drugs are defined as controlled resistant hypertension with those not controlled. And again, as you can see, uh, there is in those with uncontrolled resistant hypertension, to, um, to uh, put it this way, have significantly higher risk of ischemic heart disease, uh, heart failure, and ESRD, and mortality to some extent. In panel C, we have compared, uh, they have compared um, URH, which is uh, uncontrolled resistant hypertension with non-resistant hypertension. Again, across the board, there's higher risk. And in the last panel, panel D, the uh, uncontrolled resistant hypertension has been compared with controlled resistant hypertension, yet you will see that there's similar pattern, still the uh, risk of CVA uh, and end-stage kidney disease are much higher um, in, in people with uh, treatment resistant hypertension. So that gives an idea about how significant the risk and the importance of, uh, of, um, of, treat, of dealing with this uh, people with uh, treatment resistant hypertension. And I will remind you only a small, even a small decrease in blood pressure makes a big difference to the, to the outcome. And as, as is shown in this meta analysis of 61 um, observational studies uh, with exactly 1 million adults, uh, and you see 2 millimeter decrease in systolic blood pressure reduces the risk of death from ischemic heart disease by 7% and that from stroke by 10%. So that's a huge benefit. Now, this is relative risk. We're not talking about absolute risk here. So if someone's risk is, say, for example, 40% as it is, that will reduce by 10%, that is 4% absolute, uh, in absolute terms of mortality, stroke mortality. So that's uh, something you have to bear in mind. So in other words, you know, whatever that blood pressure is, if you can, even if you can't get it down to normal, if you can get it down to an extent, that will make a big difference to their um, cardiovascular uh, risk and mortality risk. So these are the causes of treatment resistant hypertension. And as I alluded to, the reporting of, you know, some people have reported 30% of patients have resistant hypertension. That's because uh, there are um, a lot of people that have apparent resistance. So the first and most common is white coat effect and white coat hypertension is often superimposed on essential hypertension. So you have people that have high blood pressure in, clinic, uh, in the clinic, um, but when you do an ambulatory blood pressure, you see that their blood pressure is actually well controlled. So that's something that first thing that needs to be, needs to be excluded, ruled out before you, um, do further uh, investigations. The second is non-adherence, and again, I'll dwell on this later on, uh, is an extremely common cause of recent hypertension. I'll show you some slides to, 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 to prove my point. Uh, physician inertia, it's quite often that doctors, we ourselves are responsible for this, that we not, we, uh, we sometimes take a slightly higher blood pressure for granted. We think, well, that's fine, that's, that's uh, probably normal for this person or we are reluctant to increase a dose of medication or another medication, uh, you know, a second or third or a fourth agent. And that is often, uh, can also be a reason of, for treatment, apparent treatment resistance. High salt intake, I don't have to tell you, being nephrologist, you know how important salt is in terms of high blood pressure. Non-steroidal, something we often overlook, people with chronic pain syndrome, you know, people that have chronic pain for whatever reason, and hypertensive, taking non steroids on a regular basis, retain salt, um, and also, as you know, the effect on non steroids on renal blood flow um, um, together uh, can cause a resistance to treatment. 
Uh, secondary hypertension that needs to be ruled out so if you ask me what investigation you should be doing you should you'd make sure that you have ruled out white coat effect by doing an ambulatory blood pressure and you do the tests for secondary hypertension to make sure that you're not missing uh, something there because secondary hypertension can make it difficult to control blood pressure and also if you can find a secondary cause like Crohn's or Cushing's or pheochromocytoma you're able to treat that quite effectively these days and then after you ruled out all these, you're left with this 5 to 10% or 10% of people that have truly resistant uh, hypertension. So I'll say a few words about white coat hypertension. This is a case study two, where we have, we have this again, a, a real patient, 78 year old female, referred by general practitioner with apparent uh, treatment resistance, taking uh, methyl dope, one nipidipine and losata, not very rational combination. I mean, you'd, I would like to see a diuretic in there, but nevertheless, the blood pressure was high. Uh, this is clinic blood pressure and uh, when, they, when she arrived in the clinic. So as I said, we always do the ambulatory blood pressure and what sort of it did. And as you see, this is the, um, so you've got the daytime blood pressure, the shaded area is the nighttime blood pressure, and then uh, blood pressure post waking up. And as you can see, the blood pressure actually isn't that bad you know, is controlled to over 140 over uh, 75, and, you know, the average, um, or slightly more, maybe 145 or so. So it's not as bad as clinic, her clinic blood pressure. But what is striking here, you must have, must always look at nocturnal blood pressure. That's very important because I'm sure you know that, noct you know, there is, we normally have a drop in our blood pressure when you, go, when you are sleeping. And lack of that or reversal of that increases cardiovascular risk and mortality significantly. And not only that, we now know that it also increases the risk of CKD and CKD progression. So always look at uh, nighttime blood pressure. So you can see in this lady, there's no significant drop in nocturnal blood pressure. So that is much more, to me, much more important than the fact that blood pressure is something like 140. 3 or 144 over 75 systolic was still high. So uh, what we did, we changed the losartan to nighttime dosage. We educated the patients about the symptoms of hypertension. Can she becomes, uh, uh, you know, hypertensive, and we discharged her back to the general practitioner. We looked at this uh, in in great detail and uh, from uh, two uh, databases that um, of patients with ambulatory blood pressure. Um, done on a regular basis, on a routine basis, and we found that um, it's very common. And and as you can see, higher the blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, so uh, the higher is the white coat effect. So in blue is clinic blood pressure, in red, ambulatory blood pressure, and as you can see, that difference between blue and red columns is going getting bigger as you move from left to right. So so normal blood pressure to stage one, stage two, and stage three. In other words, people that have stage three hypertension or uh, severe hypertension are more likely, by clinic readings, are more likely to have a uh, have, uh, white coat effect. And in this case, you can see the average difference in systolic was 40 millimeters of mercury, 40, in those with the clinic blood pressure were 180. That's absolutely astounding. And the, on the right-hand panel is the correlation. You can see the, the correlation between mean clinic blood pressure and white coat effect on the y-axis. And you can see there's a very good correlation between, um, between clinic BP and white coat effect, both systolic and diastolic. So uh, suggesting that higher the blood pressure, more is clinic blood pressure, more is the white coat effect. And this is kind of uh, the conclusion from that study we did that more than 50% of treated hypertensive have significant white coat effect. The main difference is as much as 18 over 6 millimeter mercury between clinic and, and ambulatory blood pressure. And when we did a, a, a multiple, multiple regression, we found ethnicity, in this case, um, um, uh, people of uh, black ethnicity more so than Caucasian or South Asian. Um, uh, female sex and clinic blood pressure were independently associated with uh, with white coat effect. Strangely, people because we in Birmingham have a very high population of Indians and Pakistanis, um, you know, the diaspora, and uh, they had much less white coat effect than the um, white uh, 
um, population or the black population, which is quite uh, interesting. Then a few words about non-adherence, as, as I said before. This is a, a, a referral letter from a colleague of mine, another hypertension specialist, professor of hypertension from another from a university. Uh, we were at the time doing a study uh, of uh, of uh, uh, ultrasound uh, renal denervation called CONA. Uh, now that's disbanded now. But if you look at the last, uh, the second paragraph, and um, this is a lady uh, whose blood pressure was 170 to 96, taking six different blood pressure tablets. And she also had sleep, uh, obstructive sleep apnea for which she was on CPAP. So the patient arrived, and this is in cl clinic when she came to see me. Um, she's a 57 year old, uh, uh, obese, BMI of 38. Uh, blood pressure in clinic was 171 over 92. So she had significant white good effects. I mean, military blood pressure was on 4784, which was quite um, reassuring. And she was on six antihypertensives at significant, pretty good doses. And what you do in a situation like this, uh, we send urine for antihypertensive drug assay. This is an LCMS MS based uh, urine drug assay. And to my surprise, they didn't find any of the drugs in the urine. Um, which tells you that. <laughs> you know, how difficult it is to, well, I'll come to the, that next maybe. So what we did was uh, she was asked to, um, advised to take amlodipin, five milligram, uh, and was given lifestyle advice. So as you can see from six drugs, because she hadn't been taking any, uh, I put her on just one um, tablet and given her lifestyle advice, and uh, especially to lose weight and, and discharge her back to the, to her, uh, to the referring doctor. The second case is even more interesting. This is a 55-year-old lady um, whose clinic blood pressures on three occasions were those uh, quite high, uh, is going up as high as 222 over 114 on five medication. Um, she was also obese, BMI of 41, and and I uh, request and I sent uh, her urine for a drug assay. And before I, uh, so she, and then she came back to clinic uh, a few weeks after, and before I approached her with the result, I had the result, I asked her what she, if she took her tablets regularly, and she said, Doctor, I take all my tablets religiously, except the furosemite, because when I'm, uh, when I, I have a class in the morning, you know, she's a teacher, um, it becomes a bit problematic, so I don't take the furosemite in the morning. To our utter surprise, it is only the furosemide that was uh, that was uh, found in the urine. Now that suggests that the second part of her uh, statement was correct, that she does take furosemide from time to time, not regularly, but she doesn't take anything else. And furosemide, strangely enough, can be detected in the urine for up to three to four days. It's got a long half-life and can be detected in the urine after, after a few days. So, uh, so that was really, um, I found that very, very strange because here is a lady who's a teacher, very responsible person, middle aged, that and that she could lie about what she, uh, you know, her medication. But when I uh, when I gave her the results, she wouldn't accept. She said that's wrong. I took my tablets, um, but interestingly, her blood pressure control improved when she came back to clinic next time, which means she started taking some of her tablets. So this is non-adherence, and non-adherence encompasses two terms. One is non-persistence, which is um, if they don't take the tablets for longer than a year. And non-compliance, if they take um, the tablets um, irregularly, i.e. less than 80% of days. So that's the combination of that is called non-adherence. Non and it's very common in all chronic diseases, including diabetes and asthma. And this is very common. So this is a study from based on um, um, single dose treatment from various. So it's a combination. It's a, derived from various studies, uh, hypertension studies that used one single dose treatment. And they found that in the um, um, in these people, that 50% of people that are start, that are treated with one tablet only for blood pressure become non-adherent by the end of the year. So 50% of patients on one antihypertensive treatment and become non-adherent by the end of the year. So that is quite astonishing. 
and we looked at it. We looked at it not in single uh, dose uh, people that are on single dose antihypertensive, but we looked at resistant hypertensives after we excluded white coat effect and second gap, which is my practice. Um, you know, um, I strategically follow that, and we found 50% of people that have a pan resistance to antihypertensive drugs are either completely or partially non-adherent to uh, prescribed treatment. Um, so what we did was, so these are people that had observed therapy. So what we did, we, 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 uh, we brought them to clinic first thing early in the morning, and then we put a, uh, a military blood pressure monitor on, and then gave them tr one treatment, so treatment in divided doses. So we would give them one antihypertensive tablet each hour, um, until their blood pressure drops. And as you can see, uh, this champ, uh, this 67-year-old uh, man uh, on five drugs, and there's a clinic blood pressure. We started um, 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 uh, blood pressure first treatment here. So every hour we gave one tablet and the blood pressure plummeted, as you can see, after three drugs, so much so that it became almost hypotensive and um, and it continued, so that's what they do. And after we observed them for a few hours and then let them go home, they come back the next day, we download the BPM and see what the blood pressure has been. So you can see he's on five tablets, but by the time we gave him three tablets, his blood pressure dropped uh, significantly and remained low. And that is, a, you know, that is the best way probably to show that non-adherence. But, but the problem is, of course, that's quite time consuming and, uh, and also labor intensive. This is looking at the people that were non-adherent. This is by ambulatory blood pressure, pre and post. And as you can see, these are the people that non-adherent. You can see their blood pressure dropped. Uh, this is pre and post uh, clinic. So within 24 hour difference here. And here, uh, the people that were truly resistant, their blood pressure actually, some of them increased rather than go down. And um, this is, is a typical picture of, uh, of non-adherent uh, patients when they're super, given supervised treatment. The different ways of testing adherence, and um, the commonest way is asking patients, which you all do, uh, the, and patients often don't tell the truth. Uh, you can do pill counts, you can ask them to keep a drug diary, uh, you can check with the chemist or the, um, or the um, um, uh, pharmacist uh, whether they've been taking, the, you know, they're collecting their prescriptions, uh, which is not difficult in, in this country because it's an organized uh, system in the NHS. And um, you can use various medications adherence scales. Uh, one uh, that's common is called Morisky. Then there are um, uh, bottles that are uh, fitted with uh, with uh, electronic chips. So every time the patient opens the bottle, um, that's, um, that that um, um, triggers a, um, a um, that sends a response to the to to the cloud saying that yeah the patient has opened the bottle. That doesn't mean they take the tablets. And then supervised administration, as I said, although they're quite uh, time consuming and expensive. But what is a, a more, uh, much easier to, much more easier to do is um, a drug monitoring, either blood or urine. Blood is expensive. And also you can only test one drug at a time. Urine is, from that point of view, is very good. So if you, you can use this uh, LCMS based, uh, uh, um, based uh, urine screening now uh, which a single assay can detect multiple drugs or their metabolites um, you can um, you just need a small um, you know a few drops of urine to get uh, the test the test that will get the results although I say low cost that's in comparison to the western countries um, but uh, it is uh, you know much less I mean even for anywhere in the world I think it'll be less expensive than having to uh, admit the patient to do uh, supervision, supervised treatment. So there are three examples that I've, uh, I've put up. This is a, this is kind of um, uh, one every year for the last three, four years uh, that have shown the, uh, the benefit of or that in all new techniques. The last one is ours, which we developed in 2015, uh, which is the uh, most, uh, most uh, um, recent and most um, evolved test, I would say, um, that um, that can uh, when we when we um, uh, set this test up, uh, we could do 23 commonly used antihypertensive drugs at one go. Now we've added more; we can do 36 um, different drugs can be uh, picked up from the urine test. Um, it takes about um, uh, 10 minutes to do the test. 
um, and you can uh, you can run a large number of samples at the same time. And this is a typical example. This is uh, in positive. These are the drugs that uh, are detected in positive uh, positive mode, and diuretics are in negative mode. I don't want to go into the details of uh, what that means, but essentially this is what it looks like when they uh, when they plot, and there's the peak suggest in how much um, um, they uh, of the drug is present in the urine. And on the, based on that, we've done just completed a study of uh, non-adherence in, uh, in 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 uh, resistant hypertensive from, from nine centres across the UK, and uh, these are people that have had uh, their white coat hypertension excluded and uh, and uh, secondary hypertension excluded. And as you'd see, that the mean blood pressure in these people um, was 172 over 90 millimeter mercury. With mean number of antihypertensive prescribed at four, and you'd see 60% of them were either partially um, um, non-adherent or completely non-adherent. So green and red. So blue, that is 40%, are completely adherent. And so an interesting thing is that the, the more number of drugs they were on, um, there's more uh, in non-adherence. I.e., uh, uh, you know, higher the number of drugs prescribed, more is uh, non-adherence. And this is not only to antihypertensive, so it's total number of drugs that they get. So they might be getting antianginals, you know, um, statins and whatever else. Uh, and so more uh, number they're having to take, the more likely they're, they're more, less likely they're going to take their uh, tablets. This is something we'll be presenting at the British Hypertension Society meeting uh, later in the year. The cost is high. I don't want to bring this up, but this is a UK costing. So it is um, it is calculated that in the UK we waste hundred million pounds a year, um, or is is lost to the National Health Service um, for um, um, patients with hypertension um, not taking their medication. So I wouldn't dwell on that. But there are various factors, and why are they on non-adherence? Uh, and as you can see from this, I don't know how well you can see this, there are many. So from poor socioeconomic status, illiteracy, unemployment, uh, limited drug supply, uh, patient-doctor relationship, uh, lack of symptoms is one big reason why they didn't take their tablets. Complex treatment regimes, as I've alluded to, the more tablets you ask them to take, less likely they will take them. Um, patient's knowledge of the disease, uh, psych psychiatric illness, etc. Um, so, uh, so there are multiple um, reasons, and there are different reasons for different people for not taking their tablets. Question is, how do you deal with that? Um, so, uh, so you cannot have the same answer for everyone. So, basically, what you need is an open and frank discussion with the patient uh, why they don't take their tablets, um, because, as I said before, because in asymptomatic condition, uh, patients are often unaware of risks of not taking tablets or the harmful consequences. So it's quite um, uh, useful to use some uh, uh, visual aids. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an example um, in the next slide. And also talking in terms of uh, absolute numbers. So as the slide I showed you earlier about two millimeter of mercury, higher blood pressure, increasing the risk of stroke and heart attacks, etc. That the patients often find easier to um, to comprehend. If but and. At the same time, lifestyle change advice is extremely important because we know that um, you know uh, lowering salt intake, taking regular exercise, or losing weight uh, are all associated with significant improvement in blood pressure, and it's all additive. So if someone reduces their salt intake and uh, take regular exercise and lose weight, they might expect to get a significant, say, 15 minimum, 15 to 9, 15 over 9 minimum mercury difference in or, 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 or uh, lowering in their blood pressure with all these lifestyle changes. This is a key risk score. This is based on the Framingham um, score. So you can you can get it on the net key risk too. So the blue means that um, uh, ones are, uh, blue faces are uh, the risk. So you can show them this is your risk over 10 year period of you know, having heart attack or, 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 or stroke, that they often understand better than you uh, talking and telling them that you've got 7% risk of uh, heart attack or whatever. And discussing medication, which I've already alluded to, the, what is important is complicated dosing regimens that are often associated with lower adherence, as I've already said. 
So monotherapy or you know making so reducing the number of drugs is is quite often very successful. And you may have to even negotiate a reduction in the number of drugs and at the same time aim for a for a higher and a more realistic blood pressure drug. You can't expect everyone to get their blood pressure down to 140-90 in these people that are on, you know, that are non ethereum or four drugs or five drugs. So try and, uh, you know, negotiate that, well, we'll aim for 150. Um, you don't need to take four, take two, something like that. Uh, that might, might work. Single pill combination. Um, I, I'm sure in, um, in in the UK it's not very popular, uh, but in the rest of the world it's pretty uh, it's more commonly used. So single pill combination drugs. These days you can get uh, one um, single drug with three different agents in it, um, and that has been found to be uh, more effective in, in in improving adherence and controlling blood pressure. And similarly, um, empowering patients, you know, if you ask them to monitor their blood pressure at home and they are more likely to take tablets because they can see what their blood pressure uh, readings are and, uh, and respond to it. So that has also been all, this is an RCT showing that that does help. Um, so control, so it's similar to, you know, if you ask a diabetic to monitor their blood sugar at home, they're more likely to be injecting their insulin more regularly or taking their glitlazide or whatever. And this is something I won't dwell on for very long because in the, the, this part of the talk is, in, is, a, is a talk in itself and um, it's quite a um, lot to say about this motivation interviewing. So uh, it's targeting the patient's own motivation. Uh, so it's kind of a psychological counseling and has been found to be effective in control, in, in, in uh, improving adherence and controlling blood pressure, uh, including one meta-analysis of seven studies shows that it does uh, lower blood pressure and significantly, but I won't dwell on that. Uh, this is a paper, if you want to know more about this, a paper we wrote in the BMJ last year, and, and it's, uh, I think it's open access, so you all can access it, so do read this, and uh, whatever I've told you about it in so far, well, it has been uh, summarized in this, uh, in this article. Secondary hypertension, I won't say much, I'll just say, and you know this very well, the renal disease is the commonest cause of secondary hypertension, and um, so you must always look for a renal disease, and then other things like Edric Cohn's, Cushing's, view. I won't go into the details of, but secondary hypertension needs to be excluded, ruled out, before you say someone has uh, resistant hypertension. Now this is the current management pathway for resistant hypertension. You've seen the algorithm, the, the, the fast part here. So uh, what you do then, you, you do a 24 ambulatory blood pressure monitoring to confirm resistance and so that they don't have white good effect, and then exclude secondary hypertension, and then add further medication. That's what you do. Um, and uh, if you uh, are not sure about uh, their adherence uh, after this, you either do supervise administration of drugs and monitor their blood pressure, or um, send the urine for if you are, it, which is probably not available in India yet in, uh, in generally. Um, but um, so that's something we you could consider when it's available. But supervised administration is certainly something to consider. And well, after that, you will find that most people are non-adherent, as I've already uh, alluded to, enhance the uh, the fatter and um, um, uh, uh, line here. And then a true drug, drug resistance is much, um, much less common. And what you do for those people which are true drug resistant, you either add further medication or uh, treat, send them for device-based treatment, which I'll talk about now. So what's the best fourth line agent after A, B, C? The best fourth line agent is spiralactone. This is from the pathway two study, uh, which is an RCT comparing and uh, spironolactone against bisoprol and uh, doxazosin and placebo um, uh, and found that spironolactone is more effective. Um, compared to placebo, it, it reduces blood pressure by 8.7 millimeters of mercury systolic. Compared to bisoprol and doxazosin, it reduces blood pressure um, an extra 4.26 millimeters, millimeters of mercury. Um, but quite interestingly, you would expect this to be in young people with a more active um, uh, renin angiotensin system, in effect, act in actual fact, the older people that responded better, uh, which suggests that this is probably mediated through sodium retention or sodium um, uh, loss rather than 
uh, through blockade of running any Tensor system downstream, which I thought was quite interesting. So that's about drug treatment. We'll now move on to device-based therapies. Now, to start with, um, you, uh, you all know, I'm sure, um, that uh, historically surgical sympathectomy was um, invented in 1940s uh, through the heart rate high, high blood pressure when we didn't have any antihypertensives. And this that's based on the fact that the sympathetic nervous system plays an important role in controlling blood pressure. But it was abundant because it was causing um, severe postural hypotension. Uh, but it led to the development of um, uh, reserpin and ganglion blocking agents. And that's the beginning of uh, development of antihypertensive medication. And um, you would probably not know, but, uh, but, but uh, the um, older nephrologists know that uh, bilateral nephrectomy was once upon a time used to treat severe hypertension in dialysis patients and with very good effect. So based on this, um, and, and, and this is because what I've already alluded to is that sympathetic uh, and nervous system plays a huge role in controlling blood pressure. And uh, here it's, it's, it's only a cartoon, but as you can see that um, that different um, uh, uh, different uh, sympathetic nerves uh, supplying the blood vessels, uh, increasing vascular resistance, vascular remodeling, smooth muscle hypertrophy with increased sympathetic output, uh, increased cardiac output and hypertrophy, and the kidney, significant uh, effect, as you all know already, it increases renin release, so RAS activation, increases sodium retention, reduces renal blood flow, all of which in turn increase blood pressure. And it is it is postulated that it's the afferent sympathetic nerves that arise from the kidney and so and go to and, and reach the um, the brain stem are the ones that mediate the whole thing. So if you can um, um, if you can stop the or reduce the sympathetic uh, afferent sympathetic output um, or input from the renal arteries, and um, that will uh, effectively control blood pressure. And the advantage is that the renal sympathetic nerves lie very close to the adventitia of the renal arteries, and hence it's easier to get to, um, and they arise from uh, T10, L1 levels. So uh, these renal uh, denervation catheters were, were um, um, devised, were, were, were uh, developed, uh, which had electrode at the tip of the catheter, this is a typical catheter, uh, simplicity catheter, uh, the first one to be, to be developed. Here is the electrode, so and this is the uh, power generator. So what you use is low power um, radio frequency uh, wave, and this is just a cartoon again of showing what happens. So you go through the femoral artery into the renal artery, and then when the when, the, um, when you go to the distal uh, renal artery, um, you um, fire. So you generate radio frequency waves that um, that then destroy this uh, renal sympathetic nerves that lie in the adventitia of renal arteries. The first uh, study, which was the observational study Simplicity 1, showed quite significant benefit, as you can see, uh, um, of, uh, um, of sympathetic renal sympathetic denervation uh, with a 12-month uh, drop in blood pressure of minus 27 or minus 17. There is a 27 over 17 minute remarkable lowering of blood pressure from baseline, which is astounding. This was followed by uh, the um, um, uh, RCT uh, uh, of um, renal denervation versus placebo, basically, and, and that showed that, uh, again, that at six months, there's a quite a significant drop in blood pressure, 32 over 12 minutes of mercury in the renal denervation group compared to the control group, which, were, and as you would see, these people were, had really significant blood pressure. Uh, you know, over 170, over 90 in both groups, and more than five drugs mean number of drugs in each group are more than five. So there's quite, they're all resistant hypertensive people, basically. And as you can see, there's significant benefit from this. However, um, when a third study was done, which is a sham control study, so in the, in the uh, intervention group, they received renal denervation. In the non-intervention group, they received a renal angiogram. So the patient didn't know whether they were getting a renal denervation or a renal angiogram, they didn't find any significant difference in blood pressure um, at between baseline and six months. And this is uh, 
And this is what uh, this slide um, shows a change from baseline um, in the uh, in the two groups. There's no significant difference in uh, in 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 blood pressure control. Based on this, this is a UK, but uh, all over the world, um, there was a temporary moratorium, uh, which is probably now uh, more than temporary. It's been a couple of years now, 2015, when um, uh, you know the hypertension specialist community in the world so this, uh, you know decided that uh, this doesn't work. Uh, so let's not uh, let's not uh, do this. Yeah. Within a few months of that, um, the uh, investigators of Simplicity 3, uh, they came up with this um, paper, which showed there were lots of flaws in this study. Um, and I've listed them here. So the less than 6% of patients had, of the total number, had uh, uh, adequate ablations, four quadrant ablations. More than 50% of, of the operators were, had, hadn't done any before uh, doing um, before joining the study. So in other words, they had a huge learning curve. And um, those who had more than 12 ablations had good response, um, rather than those who had less than 12 ablations. So ablations, this is, these are the times uh, the radiofrequency um, 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 waves were generated um, between the two arteries. Um, adherence wasn't tested. And again, this is something I, f I find very um, curious that they did this study without checking their adherence. So what happened probably that people that even had uh, uh, didn't uh, were not in the active arm but had um, uh, had just an angiogram uh, or started taking the tablets probably uh, and hence they didn't see any difference in the, in the blood pressure. There's significant improvement in blood pressure in non-black in the Caucasian patients, but not Caucasian only, non-black patients. And so that subgroup analysis um, suggests maybe there's a mechanism, but there's a reason why it doesn't work in non-black uh, patients. And we know why, because um, sympathy overactivity or RAS overactivity is not the underlying cause of primary hypertension in, 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 um, in African Caribbean uh, patients. Also, those uh, younger patients responded better. So there are a lot of flaws that were, that were uh, found. Um, so, uh, and, and they're genuine ones, especially the fact that most people didn't get proper uh, treatment. Uh, but based on that, yeah, then they, still it's a sham control study, and uh, the, um, the, uh, the hypertension specialist, um, um, specialists all over the world, um, uh, you know, still took, uh, didn't take notice of these flaws uh, or haven't uh, as yet. Immediately after that, the, the uh, registry data of global simplicity, which has been collected all over the world, and we also supplied uh, data to this, um, and found that uh, it actually did work in people with severe hypertension. Um, and so those with blood pressure over, I think they're over 180. And again, this is um, clinic blood pressure lowering, and, uh, and this is, um, this is uh, ambulatory blood pressure lowering of about nine millimeters of mercury after a year from baseline. So real world experience showed, showed that it, it did work. Um, and then there was this study, which was probably the best study done so far, where they compared, um, I'll just go back on the slide. So they, they compared optimum and state care standardized. And so they, in one group, uh, so in both groups, they increased medication to the maximum tolerated. And one of those groups, and then they were then randomized to uh, receiving uh, 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 renal generation. And they found that and between the two groups, there was significant difference in uh, blood pressure control, suggesting it, it did work uh, definitely against uh, uh, in a, uh, increasing a number of uh, medication uh, for blood pressure. And they also um, looked at adherence in these people, which is, I thought was a positive for this study. And this is our own, our own study, our UK study. We also then uh, collect, uh, we then, um, uh, you know, put together all the uh, UK renal generation we had done 253 uh, by that stage, which is kind of similar time as uh, when Simplicity 3 was uh, was published. And we found quite strangely, it's the people that in quartile 4, so if you can do this is quartile 4 is purple, uh, quartile 3, which is the quartile of blood pressure. So if you divide the blood pressure up, uh, you know, in the baseline, 
uh, by in the, in, by quartiles. So those in the highest quartile, i.e. those had highest blood pressure, average around 180, did respond uh, significantly, uh, which is both by office and clinic blood pressure. So this is our experience in the UK, and most patients in the UK, if not all, had their white coat hypertension uh, ruled out and secondary hypertension ruled out and adherence checked before uh, they had you know, the innovation. So the jury is still out, and I, I am, of course, a believer in uh, you know, you know, sympathetic innovation, but uh, I do believe um, we will see um, more uh, studies coming out, coming out um, in the future, which might show uh, that it does work. And this will is helped by the fact that now we have uh, this is the this is a single electrode catheter, but now we have multiple multi electrode catheters like this, where you got multiple electrodes. So all you have to do is fire once; you don't have to fire multiple times. Uh, so once you've got into the renal artery, distal artery, just fire, and that will ablate uh, renal sympathetic afferent sympathetic nerves more effectively. Uh, that's the idea, and I'm and I'm quite hopeful that once uh, these are. Uh, studies are being done with these, we might see a, a different result altogether. So that's renal denervation. And what I didn't talk about is the ultrasound renal denervation, and deliberately so because of time. Uh, well, that's another uh, study that's been done and will be published soon. Uh, so I'm not going to say much about it now. Um, ROX coupler, I don't know if you've heard of this. This is a small device um, here that is placed between the um, uh, internal iliac artery and vein. So create a small AV fistula, like dialysis fistula basically, but it's a very small fistula, uh, less hemodynamic effect of that, which has been in an RCT, uh, which was published in Lancet last year, um, showed significant um, improvement in blood pressure control, uh, both by office blood pressure, which is clinic blood pressure, and also by 24 ambulatory blood pressure monitoring at six months. So this is quite encouraging. The problem with this is that because you're creating an AV fistula in the, in the, in the thigh or uh, in the upper part or in, in the, uh, close to the, you know, in, in the internal iliac artery, internal iliac and vein, and artery and vein, the, this is, the problem is it causes severe edema of the leg and uh, that's, one reason, um, and this has not been as popular as it should have been, uh, but we'll, I'm sure we'll see uh, this happen. Um, uh, you know, or I'm sure we'll see more uh, studies coming up with this, maybe in the other parts of the body. Uh, but you know, analogy is uh, we. I don't know your experience, but I seem to think that blood pressure control does improve in renal patients after they've had a fistula created. Uh, but uh, that hasn't been proved yet. Another device that's been uh, actively um, studied is carotid uh, baroreceptor stimulation. So the idea is again the same. If you if you can, if you stimulate the carotid baroreceptors, that will uh, reduce uh, sympathetic activity and increase parasympathetic drive, which in turn will have these effects on the heart. Uh, reduced heart rate, irritability, vasodilatation, uh, reduced arterial stiffness uh, on the kidneys, diuresis, and natriuresis, and all of which um, um, you know, uh, can lower blood pressure. And again, there's a study done. This is, um, there are a few studies done, but this one that I've um, chosen to show you is quite significant um, uh, um, improvement in blood pressure with systolic and diastolic. Um, uh, com uh, in uh, at three and six months with using barostim in people with uh, resistant hypertension. So there are these three devices that have been tried. There are other devices um, that are less popular, um, and I'm sure we'll see more of uh, more devices um, um, uh, coming out in, in the next few years to control to, to control blood pressure in people with resistant hypertension. So in summary, what I've said is um, the prevalence of true uh, uh, treatment is hypertension is around 10%, and these people have much higher risk than control hypertension. White coat hypertension, non-adherence, and secondary hypertension need to be ruled out before you uh, 
if you say that someone has treatment resistance, um, more than 50% of patients with treatment resistance hypertension are non-adherent to the medication. So that's the commonest cause of non-adherence, uh, of uh, apparent uh, uh, lack of response to treatment. Urine drug assay is simple and reliable way to detect, and this I'm sure will be more popular throughout the world in the near future. There are many factors responsible, and so there's no single solution that uh, for uh, that can uh, uh, that will help uh, everyone. Um, it's very important that we negotiate with the with the patients about uh, their number of medication, and uh, so a reduction in medication and higher blood pressure goal might often help in controlling blood pressure better because as you've seen uh, people, uh, these people quite often don't take their tablets because there's because of the pill burden single pill combination therapy and motivation in interviewing and similarly uh, empowerment uh, with asking them to control that check their blood pressure themselves uh, help adherence and blood pressure control Spironolactone is the best fourth line agent and that should be uh, should should become routine, should be routine uh, However, the problem, of course, is you know, in men it causes gynecomastia, so that's uh, sometimes limits its use. But um, epineurone, uh, which is um, a, a, a in the same class, but doesn't have that effect as uh, can be used, but it's more expensive. Uh, to uh, consider device, it should be uh, the device therapy should be considered in true resistance. All the results so far haven't been very encouraging, but I'm sure in the future we'll see more devices coming to market. And as I said uh, already, the renal denervation has been discredited, but there were a number of flaws in design and conduct of simplicity study which we need to take account of. So if people are truly resistant and have may, are many drugs. Um, there is still a room for uh, considering uh, renal denervation.